Yes, yeah, so thank you. I'm um, excited to hear the, with the talks we have here. Um, as um, you know, it's about the behavioral potential part of it, so the second part of the model. What we have first, the technical potential, and then they go to the behavioral potential. If you think about the slide that uh, Michael put up, and so there's a number there for behavioral potential. And it, so it looks like it's kind of a constant, but it's not really a constant. And behavioral potential is, um, varies not just across behaviors, but a, about a whole bunch of other topic areas. So even in the original paper, uh, one of the things that I think Paul was mentioning is that, that it's noted that these are the things that will happen when you, recommendations when you use good interventions. And so good interventions are an important part of obtaining behavioral plasticity. So you can have, um, more plasticity, in a sense, with a better intervention. So tying those two things together is one of the things that both Alex and Kim are going to do on our panel is talk about both those interventions, how we get interventions related to stronger change. Um, but behavioral plasticity also can be a function of what behaviors, um, the behavioral context. So what behaviors are being done with other behaviors. And so that's what Heather will be talking about is relationships among behaviors in order to in increase or maybe even decrease at some points different types of the degree to which you have behavioral plasticity. And then it's also who. So we got into some who's in the last session as well. But behavioral plasticity is not a constant across people either. So some groups of people are more, have more plasticity than other groups. Um, and some of that you might start thinking about that's the target audience effect. But it's also I think it's, it's a sign that people can change. So if there's one group that is doing more and another group that's not, not doing as much, you might be able to make the group that's not doing much do more, which is by understanding those differences. So those are the sort of things that I see across the, the panel is to think about how plasticity can be changed how, and how can we take advantage of the plasticity that we know about with different interventions. Um, so our first speaker is Alex Mackey. Um, he is a congressional fellow at the policy um, He's a Christian Science Policy Fellow with APA, the American Psychological Association, and the AAAS, the American Association for Advancement of, um, of Science. Um, he works on climate and environmental policy um, in the United States Senate. Um, he got his PhD from Minnesota. Yay, that's where I got my PhD. Um, so he, um, or he did work on um, theory-based interventions for uh, influencing environmental health and pro-social behaviors. He was a postdoc here. He's one of the postdoc groups here from um, Vanderbilt Institute of Energy in the Environment and Climate Change Research. And this is where he examined how people perceive environmental policies and how to help people have constructive conversations about environmental issues. But right now he's going to be talking more in terms of actually the um, behavioral plasticity in relationship to interventions. So uh, I'll let you do that. Great. Well, I'm excited to be here. Um, excited, excited to be part of this event. And I'm particularly excited to talk about something that I, I particularly love, which is meta-analysis, which is pretty geeky, but I think can give some pretty interesting behavioral and policy insights, um, particularly when it comes to saving energy. So real quick, what is meta-analysis? So a meta-analysis essentially takes all the studies on a given topic and tries to make sense of where there's inconsistencies and where, for example, interventions are more effective. So let's say we want to help households here in Nashville save energy, and we randomize neighborhoods to either getting uh, some kind of flyer with tips on saving energy or not. And let's say those flyers, on average, uh, decrease household energy use 10%. That's good. That's an interesting insight. Now let's say we go run that study in Minneapolis. We find it leads to 20% energy reductions. We run that study in Austin, Texas. We get 2% energy reductions. How do we make sense of those differences? Um, what's kind of the common wisdom there? What's the average effect? And what are the kind of the differences across those contexts? What can they tell us about more effective policies in the future? Uh, so meta-analysis is really nice in a lot of ways because it can tell us, you know, do inter different interventions influence behaviors? Let's say energy use at home. Do they actually influence actual energy use? But again, can, it can tell us whether certain inventions or interventions are more effective and whether certain behaviors are more likely to change. Are they more plastic or not? according to intervention. So I'm going to walk us through some meta-analyses that have come out in the last 10 years on changing particularly energy use behavior, but a couple of meta-analyses that look at other environmental behaviors as well. So one common approach to changing behavior is informational approaches or persuasion approaches. So for example, sometimes uh, messages try to get very visceral, 
uh, give you a sense of, for example, how your water bottle uh, use and consumption can influence other outcomes like air quality or carbon emissions. Uh, sometimes we use uh, flyers that are um, something like this. I love this town, but the traffic is killing me. That could maybe be said for Nashville sometimes, uh, but maybe other cities even more. Um, and this is one that I like that's pretty creative. Uh, it's actually a paper towel dispenser in like a public bathroom. And as you pull out the paper towels, it actually depletes trees out of South America. You could say taking a trip or maybe a guilt trip to South America. Uh, but it's one way to try and persuade people to conserve resources. So there's a meta-analysis that was done a few years back. Uh, that was really nice. Um, a lot of these are experimental studies. So they randomize different households, the interventions, for example. Uh, I'm going to have a lot of numbers up here. I'm going to just try and point out the most important ones. But I do want to point out the top line numbers for this one real quick. This K1 equals 156. That means they actually did a meta-analysis of 156 studies. So pretty impressive. The N here means that across those studies, there were over 500,000 participants or households. Right? So that's a pretty nice number. It can give us some kind of confidence in what we're finding. And what they looked at is informational interventions to decrease home energy use. And they found that on average, these interventions led to a 7.4% reduction in home energy use. And that's a number that I'm going to kind of keep coming back to throughout this. This is kind of an overwhelming uh, chart of numbers. I'm going to throw a couple of those at you. Uh, but what I want to point out is that the average effect, which is in the top right there, is at 7.4%. But we see variability in home energy use reduction, home energy uh, reductions according to style or intervention or informational approach. So the most effective one is kind of in the middle. That's the audits and consulting. So if you give households free audits and free consulting on how to save energy, how to maybe get retrofits to your home, those interventions on average lead to 13.5% reductions in energy use. Social comparisons on the bottom, which is kind of a, a hot area with social norms. If you tell other people that other households are saving more energy, that leads to, on average, 11.5% reductions in energy use. Uh, so we see some variability. The least of effective, actually, in this context, they found was monetary incentive, incentives, which is a reduction of only 5.7%. So my main point is that there's variability in how we approach changing behavior um, to reduce energy use. Another very common approach is using feedback. Uh, this t image in the top left was actually um, a product that was being designed that would glow different colors in your household to give you feedback on how much energy you're using. I'm not sure it actually ever made it to market, but it's an interesting idea. Top right is uh, energy use, kind of what you might see on your bill, according to month or week. Uh, and then the bottom one is uh, feedback on your driving, actually. So telling you whether or not you're doing kind of efficient job of driving. What they found is that on average in this meta-analysis, feedback interventions, which are on the bottom here, led to an 8% reduction. Okay, pretty similar number is at 7.4 before. Uh, but also found that uh, these numbers are a little bit hard to see, but different types of feedback are more effective. And what they found was most effective feedback was one to four times a day. So not once a month like your home energy bill. Maybe not always right in your face all the time, continuous, but uh, frequent enough that you have a good sense of what you're doing and how it's influencing your energy use. They also found that the most effective kind of messaging to include in feedback was actually having people set goals and then reflect on whether or not they're meeting those goals. Right? So it's kind of individualized or tailored to the person, um, but can give you some, feed or some ideas on how to lead to more effective feedback, which is comparing to what people are trying to essentially do themselves, their own goals. Financial in influences. You know, a lot of economic work is focused on this. I just want to point out one meta-analysis that was done by some no-name researcher um, back in 2016. But one common principle in psychology uh, is the idea of uh, how frequently you reinforce people's behavior with financial incentives. So this, um, uh, this lottery machine here, um, the slot machine, is a good principle to think about how to give people financial incentives to influence behavior. This is called variable ratio reinforcement, according to psychology, but I like the slot machine idea. It essentially says, if you want to influence frequent energy use behavior or other kinds of environmental behaviors, you should give people a significant reward, but not exactly when they might expect it, so it's kind of random, um, and that the amount can be somewhat random too, right? So they're kind of working towards some goal, some reward. They're not exactly sure what it is, not exactly sure when it's going to come, um, and that can be the most effective, at least for repeated behaviors, not necessarily for one-time adoption behaviors. Okay, social influences. We know social influences can be very important. I already mentioned social norms. But there was one meta-analysis that was done that looked at um, most effective approaches to influencing people through social relationships. And what they found was that block leader approaches can be really effective. So if you have like a go-to person in your community who's the expert, let's say, on recycling, 
that that person can kind of facilitate behavior change through known relationships. Um, same with green teams. They also found that social influence interventions can be more effective um, for employees than households, which is kind of an interesting dimension that I'm going to come back to at the end, um, but suggest that the context can, can influence whether or not interventions are effective. And then finally, I want to point out one overwhelming meta-analysis. This was kind of like the big first meta-analysis in the environmental behavior change area. It's as Boltzen and Schott from 2012. And what they actually did is they mapped out different kinds of behaviors and different kinds of interventions and made this really cool chart. So on the top uh, x-axis is the type of intervention. So it says uh, easy, prompts, justifications, instructions, rewards. The y-axis is types of behaviors. So the idea is you can kind of look at, okay, how effective are different interventions at changing different types of behaviors? So this is um, public recycling and ease, ease intervention. So this is like having more recycling bins around, um, decreasing the inconvenience of recycling. And the numbers there as a whole, just a good principle for kind of this talk is bigger numbers are better. There are different studies use different types of effect sizes. You can get into it if you want. But essentially, that's a really big number, that 1.46. Um, so that suggests ease interventions are pretty effective at increasing public recycling. Um, where else do we see big effect sizes uh, according to behavior type? So uh, these uh, numbers at the end, again, bigger numbers are better. They suggest that certain behaviors are more likely to be influenced by interventions um, than, than other uh, types of behaviors. So we saw public recycling is one behavior that seems to be particularly plastic, that interventions are pretty effective at uh, changing. Public energy conservation uh, has a relatively big effect size compared to some other ones here. Uh, water conservation, so to the extent there's indirect kind of energy effects and carbon effects of water. Uh, gasoline conservation, um, which is nice to see as well. So maybe it's possible to get folks to drive more efficiently or choose more efficient vehicles. And then there's one that I always like to point out in this chart, which is home energy adoption. Um, there are only two entries in this whole row here, to, which is to say that there are, at this time at least, were only two experimental studies that try to get people to adopt energy efficient appliances, change energy efficient heating and cooling systems, all those kinds of behaviors that we've been kind of talking about already as maybe being the most effective ones to actually reduce carbon. So uh, a lot of room for growth, at least from a social psychological perspective. Okay, so that was a whole lot of throw. Let me conclude really quick. What do we learn? What are, what's most effective? Um, for home or workplace energy use, audits can be really effective at reducing energy use. Frequent feedback, ability to reflect on your own goals for saving energy. Social influences like block leaders and green teams. Variable schedule reinforcement, or just think about slot machines. Um, and one thing I just want to mention is a lot of these reviews, including some that I didn't even fit in here, found the sweet spot seems to be in this 5 to 15% energy use reduction. There's actually a meta-analysis I didn't include on um, efficient use of transportation or public use of public transportation. They, too, found that a lot of interventions lead to about a 16% increase in um, kind of more efficient transportation behavior. Also some interesting implications, a number of reviews have found that public settings may be particularly plastic for behavior. Now a lot of the home adoption behaviors we talk about are obviously focused on the home, but there's something about social settings that might kind of prime people to be a little bit more willing to change their behavior. And bottom line, we need a lot more research and eventually meta-analysis on one-time adoption behaviors, which could be really the sweet spot for having more effective change. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> this is Tom Dietz. Uh, a quick question. In, in the last session, one of the ideas that emerged was variation across subgroups within the population. Mm -hmm. Most of the meta-analyses I see in general, but in psychology in particular, will look at variation in effect across different kinds of interventions. But I rarely, if ever, have seen people look at across what kinds of communities were these studies done in? You mentioned the difference between household versus work setting, which I think right. is interesting. But has anybody sort of moved over into the meta-analysis literature where you look at characteristics of the communities where the studies were done as potential influences on the effectiveness of the intervention? Yeah, I think it's a really great point. I mean, one of the strengths of meta-analysis is they can look across all these different dimensions, right? You just have to code the studies for it, assuming the original studies also looked at the dimension. You know, very few of these meta-analyses look at any kind of variation in population, even very broadly defined, or demographics. 
Yeah, I think in our financial incentives meta-analysis, we looked at just college-based samples versus general population samples. Um, I don't think we saw a lot of differences, but that was as much nuance as we could really get into. Um, I think that transportation meta-analysis that I cited, they did look at income, and they found that uh, people with higher income are more, more plastic, essentially. They're more likely to have larger effect sizes. But uh, that's kind of consistent with stuff we've already heard. Um, but that's about it. I mean, I think it's a huge room for growth. That kind of 5 to 15% energy reduction that I was kind of saying kind of emerges a lot, you know, that, that is collapsing across a lot of potential subgroups, right? You could have some groups that are decreasing energy use 20, 25%, some that are 2%. And I think first just getting a better sense of who those folks are can reveal what's going on in that context that makes their behavior a little bit more plastic. Um, and that can point towards future research and policy recommendations. That's a good question. Uh, Tom Lyon, um, Tom number two. Uh, you cited an average for social comparisons that was an 11.5% reduction. Yeah. And I was just surprised by that because O Power, which yeah. you know, is working really hard on this and is heavily funded on it, gets about 2%. So mm -hmm. how are these other guys getting five times as much as O-Power does? Yeah, so I will say there have been a few other meta-analyses on uh, social norm comparison and even like the, um, the feedback that O-Power does. Um, and a lot of those have found smaller effect sizes, I will say. So they're maybe closer to the four to six range. The other thing that O-Power, those kinds of studies, um, they're often done in a lot more varied contexts. I mean, they do it sometimes across multiple states and also across time. Right? And so a lot of these studies, they might only have a, a short time frame. And so there might be drops in effectiveness uh, over time that O-Power is picking up and those kinds of studies pick up. But some of the studies include the meta-analyses haven't really explored. So um, I, I think I will say when it comes to the social norm comparison, I think that 11 and a half is pretty optimistic given some other studies out there. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a quick uh, technical question is to what extent do you worry about or address the potential that the meta-analyses are biased because of publication bias towards statistical significance? Uh, we worry a lot, yeah. So I think if, you, you know, if you're a well-intentioned you know, meta-analyzer, there are a lot of steps to try to address that. You reach out to the community, to leading scholars in the area, listservs to ask for unpublished data, no effects. You include those, you can test those if you have enough data. Um, but it's a huge problem, and it probably means that a lot of effects are a little bit overstated. Um, there's um, John Ioannidis, who does a lot of meta-analyses in the health area. He has a paper, I, I forget what it's called, but I think it's like most real associations are inflated. Um, and so his argument is that because we're missing a lot of data, a lot of null effects, we're probably overinflating some of the effect sizes. Maybe I can just sneak one in while you're introducing the next speaker. And I'm going to ask this to Alex, but you don't need to answer this right now, but I want all the speakers, if you would, to think about this, which is one of the biggest problems I find as someone who tries to, to design implementation programs for this is this stuff is um, complex, and, and Tom's going to add a level of complexity by suggesting that we think about both subgroups as well as subtypes of behavior. And yet if you're a policymaker, you've got about five minutes to think about what the implications are of the research in this area that you can then design into a program probably. And so I'm thinking about, I'm wondering about what the mechanisms might be to synthesize this in ways that are tractable for people who actually want to go out and design the programs that would, would make these actually change behavior. And you don't need to answer that now, but maybe when we get to the end of the program, we can think about that a little bit. Sure. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Heather Trulove. Um, Heather is an associate professor at the University of North Florida, and she didn't mention this, but I saw it on your webpage, that you've got the uh, Outstanding Undergraduate Teaching Award, which is great. She's a great communicator. But I think that's partly what that uh, reveals. Um, she got her master's from the University of North Florida, um, and she got her PhD from Washington State and she's one of the foremost experts we have on behavioral spillover, so she's going to tell us what she knows about that. Close your eyes. Alex went too far. Your eyes are open. You can see what I'm doing. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk to you guys about a study that several of us here have been working on, investigating the effects of pro-environmental behavior spillover on on behavior and it, some implications for the behavioral wedge. And this is a meta-analysis, and now you've been really primed by that with Alex's talk, a meta-analysis we've been working on that Alex is hopefully going to submit today so we can celebrate over a happy hour tonight. 
Uh, so the main question we're talking about when we think about behavioral spillover is the extent to which the performance of one pro-environmental behavior following an intervention leads to future behaviors. Does it increase their likelihood? Does it decrease their likelihood? Or does it have any impact? So really what we're saying here is that if you create an environmental intervention that encourages people to do a PEB1, we say that for initial pro-environmental behavior, what does that do to their propensity to do other PEBs? And there are three possible kind of outcomes here, right? You could convince someone to do one behavior, and that could lead them to be more likely to do a second behavior. We call this positive spillover. Now, the literature suggests, and we hypothesize in our study, that if your intervention focused on identity or increasing someone's intrinsic motivation, that that would lead to positive spillover. They do their first behavior, and then they sort of see themselves as an environmentalist, right? They are planet girl, and they want to continue on doing more behaviors in line with this identity and be consistent, do more pro-environmental behaviors. And this has a lot of intuitive appeal. If you can just convince someone to do one initial behavior, wouldn't that be lovely? You convince someone to recycle. It's, Alex showed that that's not that difficult to do. Wouldn't it be great if they kept doing more and more and more behaviors that are conceivably more and more difficult? So this has a lot of intuitive appeal. On the other hand, we have the potential for negative spillover. So negative spillover would happen if you encourage someone to do an initial behavior, and they're then less likely to do a secondary behavior. And the research would suggest, based on theory, that if you, incentive, if you have an incentive intervention or a guilt-focused intervention, that might lead someone to do their first behavior, and then they say, you know what? I got my incentive, I'm pretty good. Or they say, I don't have any more guilt, now I've done my first behavior. They feel licensed to not do a second behavior, so they can kind of rest on their laurels. And this has also gotten a lot of attention, this idea of moral licensing. There is evidence that we have a moral balance sheet, that we actually keep track of the behaviors that we're doing. And if we do a moral good deed, we can kind of take a hit to our moral self-image and not do another one later on. And this has gotten a lot of traction as well in terms of the literature. So there's some concern that if we encourage people to do these easy behavior, we're actually taking focus away from more impactful behaviors and from policy support. So by encouraging people to do these easy behaviors, does that mean they're less likely to support big policy changes that we need to actually mitigate climate change? And there's a third potential for no spillover. So the idea here is that People might make their decisions based on cost-benefit analysis, and whatever you decide to do for the first behavior doesn't really have any impact on your second behavior. So we have several research questions that we investigated here. The first one is what I'm kind of describing, right? Does pro-environmental behavior spill over? And if it does, is it this virtuous escalator, or is it more of a negative spillover? Either way, are there interventions that might be more likely to lead to spillover? Either positive spillover, that would be great. We could encourage people to do uh, behaviors based on interventions that might lead to positive spillover. But we could also know if interventions lead to negative spillover, we could avoid those. And then the last question you want to investigate is, are there particular characteristics of the pro-environmental behaviors themselves that might lead to positive or negative spillover? So you already know all about meta-analysis because of Alex's talk. And getting back to this question about uh, the literature being unpublished, we included papers that were unpublished and published. We had 77 effect sizes from 25 manuscripts, so it's kind of a small study in comparison to some others that have been done. But in this area, this is the first meta-analysis that's been done. We looked at three different potential outcomes. So people uh, measure behavior differently across studies. Sometimes they measure behavioral intention. So they ask participants how likely they would be to do a behavior in the future. In some studies, they ask you about actual behavior. Sometimes it's self-reported, would you do this behavior, or do you do this behavior? And sometimes it's actually observed by the researchers, and we called that behavior. And then we also looked at studies that looked at policy support, so people's indication of how much they would support a policy in the future, or even not right now. So getting back to our first question, does PEB spill over? Remember, we have these three kind of possible competing hypotheses, and wouldn't you know we found support for each one? For, for intention, we found evidence of positive spillover. So if you encourage someone to do an initial behavior, our research showed that that would increase their likelihood of intending to do future behaviors. That's a very small effect size. 0.17, just for a really rough rule of thumb, a small effect size in this area might be considered 0.2. 0.5 might be moderate, and 0.8 might be large. So we're talking about a small effect, but it's still significant and it doesn't include zero in the confidence interval. Now what about behavior? For behavior you can see we have a, evidence of negative spillover, but it's tiny. If you convince someone to do an initial behavior via an intervention, you might see some negative spillover behavior, but it's 
almost non-existent. And then finally, for policy support, we see no evidence of spillover. Okay, so what about our second question? Which interventions might lead to spillover? Well, we coded behaviors based on, or we coded studies based on that initial intervention. Now, some we categorized as identity. Those were studies that tried to encourage people to really rely on their environmental identity. Some studies actually focused on intrinsic motivation. So this would be more like environmental values related research or interventions that said, you know, you can really reduce carbon emissions if you do this behavior. And then we also looked at incentives and guilt. Both of those we thought would lead to negative spillover. So what did we find? Well, we didn't find much. <laughs> We see for intentions, there's some evidence that identity and particularly intrinsic motivation interventions could lead to some positive spillover for intentions. And perhaps guilt is, that confidence interval actually includes zero, so it's not significant, but it's trending that way that guilt interventions might lead to negative spillover to intentions. We don't really see much happening for behavior, and we don't really see much happening for policy support. And then our last question is, which PEB characteristics might lead to spillover? And this, I think, is really where it's interesting to think about uh, the behavioral wedge. So we looked at the difficulty of the initial behavior, the difficulty of the secondary behavior, and how similar the behaviors were. And the idea with the difficult first behavior, if you can encourage someone to do a first behavior and it's hard, whoa, man, they look back at that behavior and say, look what I did. I did this really hard thing. That would activate their identity, and we expect that would lead to more consistent behavior, positive spillover. And when we look at difficult PEB1s, we see a little bit of evidence, kind of, not, again, not statistically significant, uh, for intention, that there is some evidence that if you encourage someone to do a difficult first behavior, they might intend to do more future behaviors. We see no effects for behavior, and, pol and no data was available for policy support. For a difficult second behavior, well, this is where we really think people might rest on their laurels. You ask someone to do a really hard second behavior, they look at it and say, oh, I don't know. Look back to their last behavior, oh, I just recycle it. I don't need to do this really hard thing. So we expect to see negative spillover here. We don't find evidence of that. And then finally, for similar behaviors, this is where we get a little bit of joy <laughs> in our results. We do see evidence that if two behaviors are similar, if your first behavior is in the same domain as your second behavior, we see evidence of a decent size effect size for intention. That if you encourage someone, say, to recycle paper, they might be more likely to intend to recycle glass. And then again, for behavior, it seems also that it's trending positive, but you can see the variability is pretty wide. Okay, so what does this all mean for the behavioral wedge? Well, I want to start with a caveat. The literature is small. As I said, we had 77 effect sizes from 25 studies. And the sample sizes among those are small, too. So even the individual studies themselves we've been using to, for this meta-analysis are underpowered. And that's sort of a problem with the literature in this area. Many studies are underpowered. So we know we find some evidence of spillover, but the effects are small. So we see some evidence for positive spillover to intention, negative spillover to behavior, tiny, tiny effects, and no spillover to policy support. This is one of the best null findings. We didn't find evidence that we should be worried at this point about negative spillover. So the concerns that have been made about encouraging someone to do initial behavior and worry that that might lessen their policy support we don't find evidence for that, at least at this point. Or the fact that if you encourage somebody to do something easy now, that might make them less likely to do a hard behavior. We didn't find support for that at this point either. And we saw some evidence that certain interventions might be promising. So intrinsic motivation interventions and maybe identity interventions have some promise. Guilt interventions should likely be avoided if you're shooting for spillover. And also, encouraging behavior to spill over to similar behaviors seems like a good strategy. And finally, this point, it's funny, it keeps sort of similar themes keep emerging. There's not a lot of literature on difficult behaviors. The difficulty uh, behaviors I showed you before we had coded as moderately difficult. We didn't really have many behaviors to code as hard or difficult behaviors. And often these harder, difficult behaviors are the ones that are the most impactful. So we really see a dearth of literature in this area. It's hard for participants to make these changes. It's hard for researchers to study them. But w more work really needs to be uh, done to understand the effects of these kinds of programs and uptake of these behaviors on future behaviors and policy support. Okay, so here's the team uh, that I just want to thank, and of course, thank the NSF for their support. <laughs>
might be the impact of that. Do you have any sense of that? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. I think most of the literature in this area really focuses on one behavior at a time to start, but often the outcome is a bundle of behaviors, mm -hmm. and that becomes a little tricky in how you sort of separate things out. But I would say in terms of theory, the more that you encourage people to do that bulk of behaviors at the same time, as long as you're framing them as environmental behaviors, that that would lead to consistency effects, make them say, oh gosh, I haven't done one behavior, I've done five behaviors, I really must be an environmentalist, let me be consistent on this path. Thank you. So, uh, you know, the articles that you're showing that might not be true appear in the New York Times. You're speaking here to 50 of us, plus some on the air, maybe, uh, maybe a million people watching in by, uh, by the computer. But uh, I think one of the fascinating things, I'll be interested in your reaction to this, one of the things that, that got me interested in this field in the first place was the idea that there's such a strong intuition among economists that the spillover must be negative. And, uh, and yet it seems like in the psychology field, there's more nuance on that that you're mm -hmm. suggesting there. And I'm wondering if there's some opportunity because the economists have a much greater access to policymakers mm -hmm. and much greater access to the leading media sources, if there's some way to have some uh, workshop that we might do or some way to see if we can get a more fulsome analysis here that integrates across the insights from different fields, because I think policy is being driven by more by what you saw in that New York Times article than by what you said today, and I'm wondering if there's a way for us to deal with that. Yeah, it's so tricky, I think, because as Academics were trained to sort of hedge our conclusions, you know what I mean? We found this but, right? So even I start in the implications talking about the caveats, right? So at this point, I would be super uncomfortable to ever write an op-ed when I know that this is only on 77 effect sizes. So I think it's this, this balance between saying kind of having some confidence in your results even though you're not 100% confident. And as an academic, for me, that's really difficult. To follow up on that, though, I thought you couched your results very nicely. If there were a really big negative spillover effect, you'd expect to see it. This kind of sets some limits on how big it's likely to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. I just a really, really follow on. I appreciate your point, but remember what Steve Schneider and Richard Moss said to the IPCC. If you don't make your results clear to the the policymakers acknowledging the uncertainty, then people who know far less than you do about it will make that case, mm -hmm. right. probably incorrectly. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> if you don't, if you don't mind, let's let Lou have the ability to think about this from a Hello. Um, hi, uh, and, uh, very interested in this, this part of the conversation. Um, because there is such a, and I work for an environmental organization, there's such a big um, divide within the advocacy community about the benefits of. Um, the, of these kind of interventions, um, uh, potentially positive, uh, you know, uh, the, the concern is more about the negative benefits. Um, but I think also just the distraction of, you know, energy, right? If you're going to, if you have a relatively, um, you know, a small window to reach uh, an individual on a particular item, you know, do you want to talk to them about behavior change or do you want to talk to them about advocacy and policy engagement? And I think that, um, I wonder if you could say a little bit more, it looked like, you know the, the the amount the number of studies that you had related to policy um, uh, engagement were were the the, the, lim the most limited. You, know, you had the the the, the you know, smallest amount of data. Or you could say more about your sense of is you know is there and maybe this to Mike's point is there um, uh, more interest in uh, within the research community on doing more in this regard and what might that look like um, uh, and uh, you know I, I I do think that we need to think about how we get that. Uh, information into the advocacy community and, and co-create some of these uh, some of this research so that we can begin to address some of the issues that are uh, really dividing the the climate movement right now in a big way yeah so the group of studies that had policy support as their second behavior we had 17 studies like that and several um, studies were ones that I had done on campus and the policy support is broadly defined as support for non-campus policies we tried to kind of scale it and other studies you know look at support for national or federal policies as well um, so I think more work certainly needs to be done in that area I would say that hasn't been a focus necessarily of a lot of research I think something that's happening with researchers is they're kind of focusing on what's easy to measure and it's surely a lot easier to ask someone, you know, how much do you support this policy in one or two questions than it is to go to their house and watch them adjust their uh, thermostat. So I think some of it is just a feasibility and practicality issue that the field is facing as a whole. 
And there needs to be more pairing with academic researchers and on the ground efforts with nonprofits and others to make these changes in the home. So you can really start to measure actual behavior. And then you can really separate out like what's happening with policy and what's happening with behavior. Okay, so our next speaker is Kim Wolski. Uh, she's a research associate or assistant professor. I don't know the difference is. Okay. Well, anyway, she is, she's at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago, and she's a research fellow with um, the Energy Policy Institute of Chicago. Her work draws on many areas in psychology to examine the behavioral dimensions of energy and climate issues, and she has an eye towards making these connections that we keep wanting to talk about in, ter in terms of public-facing um, policies, so publicly doing things for policy impl implementation. Um, and she is most recently working with um, the National Renewable Energy Lab at the Department of Energy's Sunspot Initiative. So, and she's got some other areas as well. But what she's gonna talk about today, I think is interesting, it's a nice transition from the end of Heather's talk, is looking at some of those high impact behaviors that um, are difficult to change. And so what can we do when we want people to get into these behavioral domains that are difficult and, um, and need to be done? And, and so I'll just let you go with that. <laughs> Thank you. And Alex and Heather have perfectly set me up for this. Um, so I'm gonna to try to share some preliminary insights on what we know about changing these high impact behaviors. And by that, I mean a lot of those behaviors that if you think back to the table that Mike showed earlier this morning, these are sort of one time or infrequent capital investments uh, that typically have high upfront costs. And the argument for pushing these is Presumably, once someone adopts this, there's some guaranteed level of emissions reductions. It's not as tied to people's everyday behavior. Um, as you probably got a sense from Alex's talk, there's a lot of research on energy conservation behavior. Uh, how do you reduce electricity demand? And most of that has to do with people's everyday behavior and not are they changing equipment in their homes. I wish I could say that this is going to be a talk about everything we know about what works. Um, the truth is there's not that much research out there. So I'm going to try to highlight some of the challenges and opportunities for policy. Um, and this is part of an ongoing effort. Paul and I, Paul Stern and I wrote a book chapter last year trying to review some of that literature and along with Tom Dietz are embarking on a more systematic review. So, as you might expect, the elephant in the room, up co upfront costs are a big deterrent for adopting these behaviors. Some of this might just be, practically speaking, people do not have the budget to pay the price premium that often accompanies energy efficient goods. Uh, but even among higher income households, you can imagine there are a lot of mental biases that get in the way. We tend to be present biased. We wanna have more money in hand now and care less about savings that we may accrue in the future. We are also loss averse um, and don't want to give up money now for some uncertain gain uh, in the future. And this isn't just about cost savings in the future, but also does getting an energy efficient washing machine mean that my clothes are not going to be as clean? Or will my electric vehicle not operate during the next polar vortex? Um, there's some risk that is accompanies a lot of these behaviors. And one of the other challenges is that people just don't think about the operating costs of their appliances, and so they're only thinking about that upfront cost. Uh, as I already kind of hinted at, the other problem here is that energy is usually not top of mind for most people. They're thinking about other concerns, which I think Leslie touched on, um, in terms of comfort and safety and performance. So, Knowing that people have this barrier, often the first trick is to try to tell people, well, look, you will save money over time. This will pay for itself. And I think one of the best researchers in this space is a behavioral economist, Hunt Alcott, who has done a number of randomized controlled trials working with retailers to see what happens if we provide this information about the total cost and how much money can be saved over time. And unfortunately, whether it's 
light bulbs, energy star water heaters, or even fuel efficient cars, providing this information has no effect on purchasing behavior. In two of these studies, they also looked at the effect of provi providing incentives. We do see that it makes a difference, although a small one. A 20% rebate increases CFL sell sales by 10%. You can see the study's a little outdated, it's not LEDs. And on their water heater study, they had two different rebate rebates that they tried. A $25 rebate didn't make a difference. A $100 rebate did, but look at how small the percentage increase is. The control group, 0.9% were buying Energy Star. The rebate increases is just by 0.6 to 3.7%. And this really speaks to the importance of thinking about how we design incentives. Um, it's not just about their size, but also the type and timing of them. So there's some research showing, for example, that people are more likely to respond to instant rebates and incentives versus things that are delayed, like a tax credit. So looking at hybrid sales, uh, a sales tax waiver was more effective at encouraging hybrid purchases than a tax credit, even though the waiver was smaller. We can also think about how incentives can help spread out upfront costs. I do a lot of work in the solar rooftop space, and really a lot of the growth in the rooftop solar market in the last decade has been because there are these new business models that mean people no longer have to buy their panels. They can lease them or pay for the electricity produced from them. And we also need to think about how to sort of guarantee incentives. So Paul and I have written comparing uh, Germany and the US on the incentive structures for solar. Germany has a feed-in tariff where there's a guaranteed locked-in rate for the electricity that's produced. Net metering here in the States is much more volatile. Some states have done away with it. Um, another way to think, though, about guaranteeing incentives is, for example, with EVs, are there charging stations in public places that make it easy for people to charge their cars? And another sort of challenge and opportunity has to do with messengers that are at the point of sale. I would say the research thus far really overlooks their role. So this could be realtors, home contractors, salespeople uh, for appliances, the repair people when your water heater breaks. Uh, overall, only a handful of studies have looked at this, and the evidence is really mixed in the context of uh, buying appliances, sometimes having a salesperson talk about energy efficiency can increase the effectiveness of a label, uh, but there's one of those Elcott studies, there were salespeople providing that information, it had no effect. Uh, what we see in these studies is, this is a different mystery car shopping study than I think the one that came up uh, this morning, but often people who are supposed to know about these goods have inaccurate information. So there is a study in Ontario that at certified EV dealerships, a third of the salespeople had incorrect information about the incentives that were available. Uh, a number of studies find that unless there's continued training, these messengers tend to fall back on their old sales tricks. So we need to think about how to be more effective in getting them to convey this information. And, um, there's an important finding here that they sort of read the customer, and if they don't think the customer is interested in energy efficiency, even if they're in an experiment and are supposed to provide it, they are less likely to provide that information. And that speaks to the point we've already, oh, I forgot about this, sorry. Um, so there's this opportunity then of how do we get salespeople to be more effective. Training is one idea, but can we ins also incentivize them? So one of the Alcott studies, I already told you that if they gave the customers a rebate, there was this tiny increase in sales. If they also gave the salesperson a $25 incentive, look at how, much, how many more water heaters are sold. So we might need to think about not just interventions to affect the public's behavior, but also these messengers. We've already hit on this. Um, this idea of thinking about different market segments. I would say that a lot of studies, we tend to look for average effects, which could be hiding the processes of change for different groups. 
Uh, Paul already mentioned this, but we've seen this with solar PV. There's also research in solar thermal and alternative fuel vehicles that the people who are the first to adopt those technologies tend to be a little bit different than people who adopt later. And uh, diffusion of innovations is the theory that kind of help us think through this. It basically describes this process by which technologies diffuse through society, that uh, the people who are at the earliest end of that trend they tend to be what we say is more innovative. They look for novel and new technologies. We have also found in the context of what might be called eco-innovations that they are more environmentally motivated. And as a consequence of this, they tend to see more benefits in these technologies and are less risk averse. Which this means that if we have some new technology, the way we try to initially market it should be appealing to these folks. And we're gonna have to modify as more and more people adopt, the people who are sort of the late majority, they're gonna have different concerns and be a little more risk averse than those early adopters. Uh, the final point I'll make is we need interventions that think more about the decision making context. And I love the way Leslie phrased this this morning. People are reactive <laughs> when they're thinking about these types of um, upgrades. If you look at people's self-reports of when they're most likely to upgrade their appliances, it's because the old one broke. Or they had some life change. They moved to a new home, they changed jobs and maybe need a different type of car. Maybe they're renovating. Sometimes it's that the policies really get people to change their behavior, but those are probably people who've already been kind of contemplating it a little bit. And I think what is least likely are the people who just sort of randomly decide one day, yeah, I, I want to go get all energy efficient appliances and an electric vehicle. And I'm being a little facetious, but I think we make the mistake of often trying to design policies to motivate people to become this, when really we need to be thinking about this space and we have this incredibly limited window of opportunity because usually if any of you have had an appliance break or gone through the stress of moving homes, you have very little time, you don't have a lot of time to invest in research, you probably already have budget constraints, and you have other concerns. It's not just about energy, I want appliances that look nice in my new kitchen, or I want a car that I'm sure will perform well. Um, so the last point here is we need to think more about these hassle factors and what makes it difficult for people to uptake policies. This is a pilot study from the UK, it's not an RCT, um, but they had grants available to help people insulate their attics and they were trying to increase uptake. And so they designed a little study where the control group, they were offering this insulation service with the standard uh, incentive that was available. They tried another treatment where uh, it's home insulation but you could get a substantial discount if you signed up with all of your neighbors and then the third condition was, we'll still give you this incentive, but if you want to pay a fee, we'll clean out your attic for you. Anyone want to take a guess? No differences between these three times the uptake where people are actually paying to have their junk hauled out of their house. So it isn't all just about money, it's really thinking about how to make it more convenient. Um, and I think that kind of raises questions that maybe will bleed into the initiative feasibility, but I, th I always think of the movie um, Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. Policy is often makes that assumption. We put the technology out there, we put out incentives, we give them information, surely they will want this. And we really need to think more about the design of policies and the context and shift the burden away from consumers to make it as easy as possible. Um, and I, I think just to hone in on this, I think we try too often to motivate change when we should be thinking more about how to create more opportunities and enhance people's ability to take advantage of them. So as I said, we're in the middle of a, a really starting on a more systematic review, but there's an early version of the review paper if you're interested. <laughs> the same two of us. We, you can tell who's it, we're totally interested in this. If I may, really quickly, it seems like you've identified a really important feature here, which is the intermediaries matter a lot. Mm -hmm. Salespeople, the car dealer, whatever it might be. 
you know, how much research is out there on how you can, like all, all the Alcott stuff says you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. What's out there that's saying this is what you can do? Okay. And do you, are you aware of any NGO or other group that has a sustained effort to target those intermediaries? And the last little sub piece of that, and you don't have to answer this part right now, but is one feature that people in the internet area are talking about is radical disintermediation. So the idea is the internet drives away that intermediary and so now you buy it directly through eBay. You don't even ever talk right. to a salesperson. And what might that mean for the research needs to understand how those kinds of purchases might differ from when the salesperson shows up? Yeah, the truck? those are both interesting questions. I think one of the challenges is there are a lot of great efforts, like what Leslie's group is doing, and yet the researchers don't necessarily know about that space. So there's good things happening, but I haven't seen evaluations to help us tease apart the effect of the different things they're trying. And then in terms of removing those intermediaries, you're reminding my students always laugh at me when I talk about going to a store. And what? I buy everything online. Um, it, it does raise this question of, could that actually work to some degree? That if you are sort of researching which options are out there, providing that information before you're ready to pull the trigger and put something in your shopping cart might be effective. All of Hunt Alcott's studies, it's at the time of purchase. And my feeling is, when I've walked into a car dealership, I already know what car I want. I'm just making sure. <laughs> and, and so a little bit of information about how fuel costs might change isn't going to persuade me. Why don't, why don't you go first? I've been talking more than you have. Um, so, uh, John Johnson, I'm from the Sustainability Consortium. Uh, we work with a lot of retailers on these kinds of issues. And one of the, there's a question here, I think. Uh, one of the, the the most challenging parts of the work we do is when we do research on cons consumers and we ask, do you care about sustainability? 75% say, yes, we care. Mm -hmm. And you ask them, will you pay more? 75% will say, yes, I will pay more. And then what happens is exactly what you just described. They don't do it. And the conclusion in so many of the conversations we have by companies we work with is consumers say they care, but they don't because they don't actually behave that way. Yeah. So. I think this also speaks to, for a lot of these high impact behaviors, it's not one decision, it's a series of micro decisions. So it could be that sustainability is what initially gets you to think about, maybe I will get an electric vehicle or a hybrid. But then as they start to learn more about those options, the economic concerns tend to outweigh that or the performance concerns do. And I think you're kind of getting at a problem we have methodologically I would love more opportunities to work with retailers and do the things like Hunt Alcott is doing of actually doing an experiment in the moment instead of relying on, on survey research. And, and then the, the sort of follow-up, first of all, yes, let's um, work on that. The, the follow-up uh, to many of those conversations with consumers is they care about it, but what they tell us is, is we don't want to be presented with an array of unsustainable alternatives. We expect the retailer or whoever it is we're working with to, to provide us with choices that are already sustainable so we don't have to think about that. We can just then think about the... Right. The yeah, sounds like trying to change the manufacturer's behavior then. Right. <laughs> okay, our last speaker. Uh, our last speaker is Caitlin Ramey. She's an pro uh, assistant professor of public policy at the University of Michigan in the Ford School of Business. Public policy, <laughs> I cut off the end of that. Um, she got her master's and PhD from Duke University and after that she was a, another one of these um, Vanderbilt fellows here on your energy and environment. Um, she's done a range of issues, some of it she was also part of the team of people doing the behavioral spillover work. Um, she's done some things on social comparisons that we've talked about as well. Um, but she also has this area about uh, impression management, how people want to do things uh, climate change mitigation sort of behaviors relevant to their concerns about impression management, which ties into some extent, and I don't know if you're going to get into that, but ties into some extent with the next part, which um, is about who are talk who's changeable and to what extent are they changeable. So it's related to what Kim was saying at the end of hers as well in terms of looking at not just the intervention and the behavior, but who our tar target audiences are. All right, so I'm actually going to be doing a slightly different thing. I'm not going to be talking about my own research that much, so you'll just have to ask me about that later. Um, but I do want to just give this like brief 
uh, high-level overview of why we might care about audience um, and whose behavior is plastic. So I, I think the, um, the original Behavioral Wedge paper did a great job of talking about the need to think about behavioral plasticity and not just technical potential. And buried in there is this idea of um, not just which interventions are going to be most effective, but whose behavior is plastic, right? Which people are we expecting to change? And what, this is often what psychologists would call individual difference factors. Um, it's basically subgroups of people. So I'm very glad to see that this is something that's been brought up um, in earlier talks as well and discussions. There are a range of individual difference factors that might matter. Several of those were brought up earlier. I'm going to give a brief overview of some here. There are plenty of others as well. Kim mentioned um, early adopters as a different subgroup. I'm not going to talk about that, but she did a great job of introducing that. Um, one thing that is common with all of these individual difference factors is that they tend to be hard to change. It, as certainly for a short-term intervention, if you are an intervener, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to change these factors in your audience. So you often have to work with these individual differences rather than trying to move them in the moment. So I first want to start with maybe the most psych-related of these, and that's environmental values and identity. So there's a whole wealth of research now looking at um, factors like uh, environmental identity, people's connection to the natural world, their attachment to particular places, um, and their values, whether they're valuing the environment itself, other people, or their own well-being. Um, all of these can affect how much people are concerned about the environment, and in turn, how amenable they are going to be to interventions that are explicitly um, explained in terms of their environmental or climate change outcomes. Um, again, these are things that are hard to instill in people in a short intervention, but you can work with people's existing levels of these identities and values um, and make those values salient to people. So even though people often, um, people vary in terms of how, much, how concerned they are, but even if they are concerned, they don't always act on those values because those values aren't made salient to them in the moment when they're making decisions. So one thing that you can do if you're thinking about doing an intervention is to take adv advantage of these existing values. For example, you could frame the behavior in terms of people or the planet or oneself, depending on people's levels of caring about those three different um, types of outcomes. Another thing is to talk about um, a treasured place. So if this behavior might affect a place that people care about, like their home, for example, or their um, particular community, you can talk about that, highlighting how this is relevant to the things that they care about already. Um, another thing that can help is to just make those identities salient to people. Remind them this behavior is actually related to this identity that you care about. People don't always make that connection that you know whether weatherizing your home might be related to a, this environmental concern that you have more generally. So making that salient to people who care about that can be really important. A challenge to this approach is that we often don't know what our audience's values are, right? So when we're doing research in these areas, we have the benefit of having access to people, being able to give them questionnaires and have them tell us exactly what they think about all of these things, right? In the real world, in interventions, that's often not a possibility. So I want to talk briefly about some other types of individual difference factors that we may have more access to, even if we're not doing a research-based study, either because these are um, elements that are available through the public domain, or because of slightly creepier methods of um, you know, online behavior, having a lot more access to, to the types of things that people are looking at, and being able to know a lot more about how people are acting and thinking, including also social, um, not social, um, smart meters. Through smart meters, we actually have a lot more information about people's behavior, too. There's obviously ethical and privacy considerations that come up when we think about these alternative ways of knowing who our audience is, and I'm happy to talk more about that later. But the point is that we actually have a lot more information than you might think. So the first of these individual difference factors that might be more public is political ideology. I, this is kind of the elephant in the room when we're talking about climate change, pun intended. Um, but I don't think I need to tell you that, um, that there's a huge political divide about climate change and about the environment in this country and that it's not exactly been getting lessened over time. And what this means is that um, sometimes we can have backfiring. We're going to um, audiences that might be mixed in terms of their political um, ideology or leaning more conservative. That having something that's explicitly labeled as environmental can actually backfire. So this is one study that was done by Gromit and colleagues 
looking at purchasing or purchasing intentions and actual purchasing behavior of CFL versus incandescent bulbs. And what they found was some backfiring that happened. So for people on the political left, if a CFL was explicitly labeled as protecting the environment, that made them more likely to buy that CFL. They, they thought, great, this, not only is this a good decision, but it reflects my environmental identity or my political identity, that this is my team likes this behavior, so I'm going to do this too. But for people on the, con on the conservative end of the spectrum, having that CFL bulb be explicitly environmental turned them off made them less likely to purchase that CFL, which they otherwise might buy. And so there, there's a potential backfiring there. It doesn't mean you can't talk about environmental issues if uh, there are people who are on the conservative right, um, political right, but it means that there, you, you might need to think about the net benefits overall of, of programs that are explicitly talking about climate change and environment if you're talking to a mixed audience. This is true. O power studies have found similar effects, so they find that they're programs are more effective in liberal communities than in conservative ones, even though they, are, they actually don't have an explicit climate change or environmental label in the feedback they're giving people. Um, so it doesn't mean we can't talk about the environment and climate change. We need to think about who our audience is for a particular intervention, um, whether to reach out to different audiences, um, and if we're going to go for everybody, think about what those net benefits might be if we're having some backfiring going on. There's other uh, social identities that also may make a difference beyond just political identity. So I want to talk about some other social identities. Um, socioeconomic status income level is one that I was really happy to see get brought up earlier, but there are others as well. So there's some really interesting work being done by Adam Pearson and colleagues looking at people's perceptions of who cares about the environment. So they, this is a nationally representative sample. They asked people, how much do each of the following groups, how concerned are each of the following groups about the environment? So Latinos, the poor, uh, Asians, blacks, wealthy, et cetera. And this is what they told them. So the American public, according to the survey, thinks that young white women care a lot about the environment, right? They're very concerned that other people don't care or are not concerned. Well, the researchers went to members of these particular groups and asked, well, how much are you concerned about the environment? And this is what they found. So it's not exactly a total inverse relationship with the stereotypes, um, but almost. So what they're finding is that actually Latinos are the most concerned about the environment, for example. Um, and so there's this mismatch in terms of the stereotypes of who we think is on board with the environmental outcomes and who, uh, who actually is. So I think this suggests that there's a big opportunity of uh, to reach people based on their environmental concern of maybe these subgroups that aren't being targeted. And it also suggests that the, there's great research by Dorcita Taylor and others looking at how this might be driven by um, who is high profile in environmental groups, climate scientists and others. Um, they tend to look a lot more like the stereotypes and a lot less like these subgroups. And so it suggests that if we're thinking about going into communities that don't fit that stereotype, we need to think about who are the people knocking on doors? Who are the people who are um, reaching out to folks? They probably shouldn't look like me if you're going into a community that doesn't look like me. We talked a, briefly about home ownership status, but I just want to flag that as another important individual difference factor, right? There's split incentives between who pays and who benefits when we're thinking about renters. And so we might need to think about um, creative approaches like green leases and others to reassign realign those incentives. And I know I'm running out of time, but I just want to say briefly that we really do need to think about our audiences for behavioral wedge interventions. Behaviors that are plastic with one group may not be with another. Interventions that work with one group may not work with another. Um, and that there's an increasing number of tools for knowing more about who our audience is. This can be highly useful. It may raise some ethical or privacy considerations um, that we need to think about carefully. So that's it. Thanks.
by coincidence, I wrote commentaries on both of the papers that you put up there um, uh, in PNAS. And I wanted to point out that there's even more that the Pearson study, as you know, but that might be worth mentioning, which is the members of those minority groups yeah. did not perceive their group as being more concerned. But a very simple intervention, just showing them a photograph of a diverse environmental group, changed that perception. So it really reinforces your point that if we think about who the messengers are, I interpret the results of that study as saying, well, folks in those groups don't perceive their group, as their community as being that pro-environmental, but it's a really easy thing to change, apparently, based on that one study. So yeah. it really is an important uh, finding. In that <coughs> yeah, I agree. And it also suggests there's a, a couple of folks have now talked about um, the importance of social norms and how social norms are even more important for low-income communities. I think Kim has found this as well for solar adoption and and um, Tony Reams has found res even like free weatherization programs. There's a lot of distrust um, of why are you getting this free thing? Why are you coming? Is this a scam? Um, so having social norms, having other people in your social network who are doing this thing not only tells you well, people like me care about this, but it also gives a sense that this is not somebody coming in from the outside to scam me. These are people who I, who I connect with who are doing this behavior. So, this is Leslie. This is really for anyone in the room who knows, but who has access to smart meter data and how can we use it? because to me it's just sitting in a database somewhere and smart meters are doing us no good unless we can analyze the data in a secure way. Uh, but there's a, there was a, um, uh, an incentive uh, for rounding up our utility dollar to the, to the next highest dollar and that funding going to help pay for weatherization programs. And my comment was, can we use the smart meter data? All of the homes in Nashville have smart meters at this point. How can we use that data to show the payoff or show the benefit or is this even working? Um, so why can't we use the data that we're collecting to do good with it? So I'll just say the utilities have this. Um, so I think often pairing with utilities is the way to go. Um, I'm actually working on a project now looking at smart meters um, to smart meter data as a way to give people different types of normative feedback about comparing them to people who have similar lifestyles. And we actually originally were working with one utility and then they got freaked out about the privacy concerns, and so now we're working with another utility who apparently has lower standards. Um, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say that on the live feed. Um, different um, beliefs about that. Um, so I think that's, that maybe the way you have to do it is working with the utilities who are collecting that data, because it's, you know, it's proprietary. They don't have to share it. Um, so we've got one the, more question, then we'll have the Can I add a quick program. comment? In some states, it's called the green button. There's some states have a program to let you act for third parties to access that data, but it really kind of depends on state law, I think. So um, one more question and then we'll... Um, Real quickly, I was um, kind of shocked by that slide that, that, that uh, talked about the label of protecting the environment and how quickly the curve dropped off. Yeah. So it wasn't even... It wasn't just the the folks on the on the far right of the spectrum. It was basically everybody that wasn't in the you know the the, the farthest left you know quintile or something, um, and 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 it wasn't climate change. wasn't the the label that you used. It was protect the environment. And what we know is protect the environment actually is you know ha, uh, or you know once you get away from climate change, you just talk about environment. You you know you, the, the political effect of that is is much less. So I wonder. Is it, is it, did you look into or do you know whether it's possible that that, that signal basically sent a signal of it's more expensive or something, N not that it was um, somehow in contrast with the person's values, but they interpreted that to mean that it either wasn't as, you know, uh, cost competitive or wasn't as effective or hit some of those other uh, buttons? Yeah, so just, that wasn't my study, but other people's, but the, that study did, it gave information about cost. It, um, and that was all the same. So the only thing that's differing was that label. And I was surprised by that too. So what you often find is that it's the political extremes are really, um, you know, react to political things and that there's like this movable middle in between. I often talk about how we need to target the movable middle of people who aren't opposed to climate change, but, you know, can be care but aren't engaged. Um, and so that was surprising to me to see that jump so early. Um, I don't see that in all the studies. Um, that I've seen in this area, so I don't know if, how much that's a fluke, but 
I was surprised by it too. Oh, well, thank you. I do want to um, make sure that we have some time to talk across all of them and have some comments and questions or you might have. And I'm going to actually first start with the part of the room that isn't talking. So is anybody in the back rows or, uh, um, well, Amanda, you haven't said anything yet. So <laughs> we'll start there and make sure that some of the other people who haven't said anything have some time to, to say something. So yeah. a more general methodological question. Um, it seems to me that we've already briefly discussed the, the false positive bias in publications as being a, ma a major threat to the kinds of conclusions we can draw. And I think a second one is the, the fact that we tend to look for short-lived effects and the, so the persistence um, of effects and the durability of these changes are, are, I think, in question. So I was just curious if, if the panel could discuss those two issues or any other sort of more systematic methodological limitations and you know, what, what can we do to address that? Where is the field going? What do you see in your data? I, I know it's a tough one, but it's, it seems like, you know, we might be drawing very incorrect conclusions, um, likely inflated effect size conclusions. So. Um, I can add just in some of the spillover work um, that we've been doing and what we've been seeing. And even when researchers um, try to target initial behavior at one time and then wait a little bit to assess the second behavior. That wait a little bit, the longest that's been is in a matter of weeks, so maybe six weeks. Um, and what you don't see is this sort of, theoretically in terms of spillover, you would have this keep going and going and going. And we, we, we very rarely see it go beyond that first initial spillover behavior. And I think that's a real limit um, in, t in thinking about behavioral wedge and others. You might have a very small effect for intention, but if that intention does translate to behavior, even if it's small, what happens in the next behavior and the next behavior and the next behavior? And I haven't seen research, looking at spillover at least, that lasts long enough to assess that. You know, I'll just say I, I think it's a huge issue. I think, um, at least in psychology, obviously we don't do it much. We don't, we don't cover it much. It almost feels a little bit like a chicken or egg issue. I think if the funding was there, folks would do it, because um, sometimes it's more expensive to run it. But I think having some of that longitudinal data makes it easier to justify running some of these studies and collecting future data. I, in our uh, financial incentives meta-analysis, we did have a few studies that um, measured um, the effect of behavior change from incentives after you remove the incentive. So we did have a few follow-up studies. And actually, one kind of interesting finding was particularly for like public transportation use. Even after removing the incentive, sometimes people's behavior stayed more or less stable. I think that maybe kind of speaks to this idea of getting people when they're forming new habits. Um, when they're moving to a new city or something, and maybe um, some kind of intervention can stick uh, at, over time. But you know, I'll just say, I mean, I think from like health data, um, pretty good evidence that uh, intervention effect sizes decrease over time. Um, but I don't think we're even quantifying it right now, at least in psychology. Economics, I mean, it does a better job sometimes. So I was thinking about it in terms of things that are, so there's, um, different types of behaviors too. So we, we kind of just glump them together, but we do have some, I mean, you had your list of behaviors, but there's a BJ Fogg talks about, you know, you want to start a behavior, stop a behavior, continue behavior, um, and for how long do you want to go for it? And I think we do need to pay more attention to those sorts of things. I also think we probably need to pay more attention to changes, you know, stages of change. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so the thermostat thing came up with that. It's like you bought the thermostat, but how do you use it? And how do you maintain it? So you've got a good car, but how do you keep it up, up to date? Or, or when you started to think about it, so we've got the intentions, well, how do we get from intentions to doing something? So I think there's, in terms of time perspective, it's not just how long does your intervention have an effect, but what part of the behavioral change are you, you operating under? I'll just jump in for these higher impact behaviors. The stages of change thing is something I think a lot about of where should we be trying to intervene? Are we trying to get someone to contemplate a behavior or are we trying to reach them when maybe they're already thinking about they need new appliances because they know they're, they're going to break soon? Is there some way to intervene then? And, and it's very hard to know how to make that intervention happen and what's the oppor opportunity there. If I could just jump into one other thing, the stage of change idea. Um, one thing that health folks also do that I really like is they sometimes do follow-up interventions. They do call it booster interventions or booster messages. Um, the idea being that people might need or want things um, to help them maintain the behavior rather than initiate it. And so I think those theoretical models and those ideas can be helpful in our field too. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'll just jump in. So I think the economists do do a better job of having the actual behaviors be measured instead of mm -hmm. intentions or like the things you can do in a lab. Um, but they but they're not measuring the the psychological variables that we think we might be important. So I think that what it suggests is like we actually need to work together <laughs> um, and have these disciplines um, you know each contribute what they can do well. Can I reinforce Caitlin's message for really? I know, I'm, but. Uh, <laughs> I just would recommend to economists and other non-economists, social scientists, that they work with an engineer or someone, and at the end of a paper, put a paragraph that says, you know, if this phenomenon occurs in this behavior, here, here are the implications. Uh, one of the things I got wrong in the behavioral wedge paper was pushing Jonathan to throw LEDs out. And that was clearly a mistake. One of the things I got right was to push hard on our co-authors to say, ultimately, these total emissions are equal to the total emissions of the country of France. Right, and we went back and forth about that. Everyone's like, well, why would we say that? But it's one of the more cited pieces in the article because it allows people to crystallize whether it matters or not. And so for spillover behavior, I worked with a couple of economists who we had 500,000 power bills, and we found that there's a little bit of a buy-in effect. When you, when you buy green power switch, you use a little more electricity. But it's 5 or 10% of the total other, other benefits of the green power switch. And if we adjust, as we were starting to, just said, hey, there's a buy-in effect, a policymaker reads that and goes, oh, I don't want to do that policy. But if instead they read a paper that has a paragraph at the end that says, even with this buy-in effect, the net effect of this program is X, then I think you're beginning to have a much more traction in having your research actually influence the correct choices of public and private policymakers. And it's hard because it means bringing another person onto the team or engaging a research assistant or something. And I'll bet your editors would say, cut it out because it's not psych, it's not econ but it really begins to bring to bear whether what you're doing matters in a tractable way for policymakers. So anybody before that? Oh, you haven't said anything yet. <laughs> All right. Is that, 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 for, for understandable reasons, look at behaviors that have low technical potential. You know, they're, they're easy to observe. Uh, they happen frequently. You can collect a lot of data, a lot of numbers on them. Um, but if you add it all up, it doesn't matter too much. Economists, on the other hand, you know, and, and psychologists also tend to look at behavioral intentions and attitudes and values and things like that that are also easy to measure um, and that have effects that are mostly indirect rather than direct. Economists, on the other hand, look at behaviors and not attitudes and values and individual differences as much, and they make generalizations from the average effect of lousy interventions, because that's what most of the interventions are. <laughs> you know, and the, and the, the trick is you know, what we tried to do in the behavioral wedge paper was to look at effective interventions and multiply them by the technical potential, uh, leading to some evidence-based, although not the strongest evidence that you would like, but some evidence-based advice on how to make effective interventions with behaviors that have high technical potential. Mm -hmm. And you know that's where we need to be going, moving going forward. Right. Just a comment. All right. Uh, Jay's right there. So I want to build on these with with another comment, which is. Um, I'm interested in what is working in practice in the field, and so building on Mike's, um, you know, we want more that is policy relevant. Um, and so, you know, however it is, whether it's putting it um, in your papers or uh, talking to uh, other audiences other than the academy. Um, I just really want to encourage that so that we can um, take the lessons that are clearly there from a lot of this research about what can be effective um, interventions, but getting them to where we're doing them because we're not. In, in, um, and, you know, some of it's we've, we've got a complicated system in the United States, federal and state, and so many of these things are actually state, um, but we need to, to do more of that. And then just one additional thing, because there was the question that uh, I think uh, Leslie brought up, you know, what's being used in terms of the, of the um, 
smart meter data and the ethical privacy concerns are very real. Um, we had it in Maryland when they um, first uh, announced that you know everybody was going to be getting smart meters and there was a huge backlash uh, about concern about privacy and the assumption of who was going to have the data and as soon as they said you were being compared to your neighbors everybody assumed that that your neighbor was going to see what your home was using and it delayed the smart meters for a while Yes, uh, so I, it, I think there is this interface we do need to figure out between what are the barriers and the policies themselves, which are, we're talking in some sense a fair amount of how to make the, something work, but policies themselves have their own set of barriers for implementing them. And um, so I think we do need to work with policymakers as well. And, and I also find that when we're trying to make decisions about particular areas, you have to end up being very individual. So you can come in with a very general statement but then to make an intervention in that situation, you have to step back and, and look at that situation. So you need to figure out what are the things that we think are important and then actually doing that as well. And so that's a, a difference when you have a, and you can have national policies, state policies, neighborhood policies, business policies, but you need to take into account that specific context as well. And I, I think there's a difficulty merging between the general research that we tend to do and that, that uh, application of it. So maybe we'll have one more comment and then we'll, we'll go for lunch because we we've got, we got lunch waiting outside and a storm of students okay. ready to come in. Okay. So, let's so I'm going to kind of give you a provocative, very provocative one to close on is we've been talking a lot now lately about ethics and as academics we're bound by ethics. People in government are bound by all sorts of ethical things. Private companies, Facebook, private utility companies don't do it. IRBs, they don't, they aren't bound by all this ethics. And so how do we think about all of this research, all of this behavioral manipulation when we start looking at the role of these companies that have their own agenda, which may be pro-environmental, but have a very different attitude towards human subjects research because they just call that marketing. Go ahead. <laughs> so I think some of the what we're doing uh, is we're we're thinking we're over here we're trying to do something in these communities as opposed to starting at the community level and working with them and then you have less of an issue of ethics when you have them on board doing something. For a fair amount of what we've talked about is is this top down processes and we need to work more with some of the bottom up processes. All right, let's thank the panel. It's been a terrific panel. It really has. <laughs> Um, and we can continue with some of these uh, plasticity issues in the second panel as well. So if you had a question you didn't get in, please do that. What I'd like to, for you to, to ask is anybody who wants lunch who is, who's in the room, go out that door and get the lunch because we also have a lunch line set up here.